we are brothers and we all grew up watching Star Trek and science fiction. We just got done watching Star Trek The Next Generation Season 1 Episode 7 called Justice. Just as a summary for everyone who hasn't seen it in a long time, the episode is about a planet called Edo and they got caught up by the system of justice there and there was a conflict between the Prime Directive um, and the Edo's justice and they found themselves having the power to override the Edo to protect Wesley Crusher, but they ran into an entity that referred to itself as God in space. And so there was a conflict. It really is just an episode about the uh, the collision of justice, law, and the concept of God. I'm curious, Scott. We'll start with you. What is, what is your like? Just give a brief snapshot of your reaction to that episode. Well, I'm going to say I, you know, I thought I had seen every episode and it wasn't until probably halfway in, into it that I realized that I had seen that one. But it was just so long ago. I, I told you before, I don't watch um, many of the first season um, or even second season episodes as, you know, a lot as of going back to revisit Star Trek. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to me, it didn't get good until like the third or fourth season. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it was it was interesting. Obviously, the uh, the whole concept, the whole notion of, you know, really how they're, you know, the at least from a storyline perspective, they're trying to present um, <clears throat> sort of the innocence of a set mm-hmm. of creatures who are on this world who mm-hmm. are really not cognizant or not realizing that the God that they worship is a God of, well, I shouldn't say a God, but basically a, some creatures of technology. Right. Um, but yet they're being, you know, they're worship, worshiping it as a God. Um, and then they have their laws that they have based around um, that concept or that notion of making sure that they please that God. And um, I, you know, just a whole, there's a lot in that show. Um, I think you had mentioned somebody had said that it was not necessarily one of the higher rated shows and I could see that. Um, <laughs> but from, yeah, at the surface level, but underneath, yeah, it's, it's some deep stuff. They touched You're, on. Okay. All right. So that's why I chose it to start here. Cause I'm like, okay, no, this is perfect for you, me and Robin, Robin, before we jump in, what is your first reaction? And had you seen this episode? And if not, or if so, how long ago was it? And what's your reaction to the episode? I actually just watched it recently um, during the uh, the freeze, the freeze here in Houston. Can you hear, can you hear me okay? Yeah, but get get closer because it's much better when it's closer. Okay. So we had just watched, I, I had just watched it during the freeze um, back in February, I think it was. Um, so I already knew um, every detail about the episode. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I have nothing to say about it. I, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I already said everything, I suppose. Uh, did you, did you, did you, so would you, okay. So it is, I started off, I'm, I'm like you guys. I really didn't start liking Star Trek until season three, but actually season really season four, season, season four yeah. is actually where I jumped in and really liked it when they finally got the collars around the necks. Um, no, season, no, season three, no season three. No, I thought it was season three. And I actually, now you make me want to go back and check. I always thought it was season three, but I believe it was season four and we can check after or somebody can Google it real quick. Um, and so it was season one and two always got a, a bad rap, even for me. And it sounds like from all of us, but when I went back to watch season one again, I'm like, wait a minute, these stories are rich. They're, they're deep as, as 1987 can be (laughs) right. And as, as television could be back in 1987. So you gotta have, you have to put it in context of 1987. So we'll get to the philosophical stuff in a minute, but in context of 1987, this thing was like. This was pushing the envelope, especially when you start off with all the 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 sensualness, the sexiness, the the you know adult nature of it, the Edo being innocent, but they're they are just uh, completely free with their sex and their love um, to the point that it made the people of the 24th century uncomfortable, right? Um, but you got to keep in mind this is 1987. Can you imagine Dada watching that with us? <laughs> in 19... <laughs> do you? Yeah, no, nah, remember... we we would have had that television turned off at that point. Right. Right. So it was the storyline is not something that we could that most people can put up with today because stories today on television, I think, are like a lot more advanced in their storytelling. And they don't do they got away from episodic um, storytelling. And a lot of everything that we like now, at least that I like now, has seasonal arcs. 
Right. And and so they in 1987, they were really strong into these really short episodes, 45 minute solution to the problem um, uh, episode of the week. Um, so this it's really hard, I think, for people in 2021 to actually go back and watch that and sit through it. But if you do, you'll see, uh, like Scott, like you said, there, there are a lot of underlying philosophical things. So um, we don't have a format for the show yet, but I took down a lot of notes. And so, I mean, we can just approach it however, and it will grow into our format as we go. But for now, um, it was a question of justice. Right. And early on, you know, all the sex of the Edo. Well, first of all, did you all recognize all the the really obvious? It was kind of obvious Edo for Eden. Right. And the entire planet was like a proverbial garden of Eden. And they were all innocent. They were all also Caucasian and blonde. But yeah, so that was that was the first thing I pointed out. Yeah. 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 The the episode. Well, first of all, um, uh, it was season three. I just looked it up. But um, the episode, there's an episode um, very neat there. This one is the season one where they talk about a very primitive or very uh, warrior like race that they have to go fight. Um, and it's all black people. It's just human. It's <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. It was the, yeah, yeah. It was the Africa. One. It was. It was. It yeah. was the. Um, they the were Wakanda the most, episode. <laughs> it, yeah. Ba- basically, and they were all a- African. Uh, um, what we here on Earth are you know consider as African culture, right? Um, yeah, that was hilarious. And it was yeah. It, you was, know, it, it was episode three, and this is a uh, we just watched episode, episode seven. seven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they showed the in episode three it at the very end it was almost like a mockery of that civilization because um the guy who won the battle and or who won the heart of the woman in that battle i could tell you i just watched all these episodes again so i remember them all very vividly but at the end of the episode he said see captain picard um what you have and which you all may be more technologically advanced than us, but you're not more civilized than us. But everything in the episode was showing us the, the viewer, how they thought that they were civilized, but it, it was almost a mockery. Like, yeah, you guys think you're civilized, but you're really barbarians. And here they had this really, and I don't, you know, we don't have to make it a, a, a racial critique because it was 1987. And even though George, Jim, um, God, Gene Roddenberry's, um, vision was amazing. You know, you could still see they fell into a, a lot of tropes, a lot of sexist tropes, the women. So but setting all that aside, coming back to the Eden, uh, the Edo, what is the, uh, what else jumped out to you? Cause you said the, the white people first and all the blind people, what other thing jumped out to you, Scott? Um, I mean, you know, that was that was basically the most obvious thing. Obviously, you know, I we're waiting to get into the more deeper stuff. But, yeah, the Eden, um, the whole setup, you know, I, to me, it, it might have been 1987 and it might have been a little bit risque, but it was fairly obvious that from from the cultural standpoint, they indicated or at least were trying to depict um, that perfect sort of society, perfect mm. Eden place um, as not only just. Uh, single race, but single race, single hair color, yeah. everybody bleach blonde, you know, blue eyes. So I, I don't know what the purpose was from a, um, you know, storyline, but it yeah. was fairly obvious. That's what the producers intended or a director, whoever did that. Yeah, I, I, I think. I mean, I guess the problem would have existed just as much back then as it is now. But you have plenty of people who look for that ethno nationalist kind of pure race thing um, for them to have a, yeah. a nice enclosed society. So I'm sure back then it was probably the same thing. Uh, but you you said something interesting there. You said that it was kind of a um, it was a distraction also. It was just kind yeah. of the, the and you notice with Star Trek, what they always did. Every episode was the same in this way, where the thing that gets them out of the ship and gets them into the story is always that's the uh, the red herring. The real story is that thing that they slightly reference. And in this episode, the the thing that was the distraction was the planet. Right. The real question was that um, that disruption that they couldn't identify the wharf identified off of the starboard bow or whatever. And this the story of this science, this technology Thing that was kind of there that wasn't there but was there and then it revealed itself to um to the crew that's the word i was looking for this whole time to the crew of the enterprise and we can clearly see that it is um it is a an, a a technology-based 
entity, whatever it is, it's technology based. It looks like a ship. It looks like technology we could recognize. It has lights. It has windows. It has a definite form. And so it was immediately a question of what is this? But as it presented itself to Captain Picard and the crew, it presented itself to Captain Picard and the crew as how we, the viewer, interpret God. This big, booming voice, leave my children alone. And the funniest thing that I got from it in the very first few seconds of their interaction was how scared Captain Picard was. His vo- Have you ever heard Captain Picard's voice shake and tremor when he's talking to an enemy or to a potential, uh, a possible danger? But when God so spoke, I didn't pick up on that. Oh man! Yeah, I, I, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, go back to yeah, that. Maybe part. I missed that. Uh, oh yeah, I, 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 yeah, I could go back to that real quick. Hey, go. Let's listen yeah. to that part. State the purpose of what you have done. I'm Captain Picard, <laughs> oh, commanding yeah, this Federation yeah. starship. Yeah. Captain Picard was shook. Have you ever seen Captain Picard that afraid? It's yeah. season one, man. Leave him alone. It's season one. He was still <laughs> developing the character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Patrick, Patrick Stewart is the consummate professional. He brought me. He knew what he was doing. How else do you expect? No, no, no. I was talking about the actor, the actor Patrick, Stewart. Patrick Stewart. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying that he obviously was a, the consummate actor at that point in time. So he acted what I feel like was probably appropriate from the level of writing and material he had been given um, up until that point. The the writers of the show had not given uh, enough information to give that depth of character to Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Stewart at that point. I don't think. Well, so maybe he was just acting based upon, you know, some, uh, some, some assumptions before he actually became Captain Picard, right? You know, as the actor, you know, you, you have some leeway, but he had not gone through, you know, and say, okay, my 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 character, Captain Picard, would never be nervous. I don't think he had well, ever he grows, had that the character chance. grows as uh, as the seasons go on, and like Patrick Stewart right. understands him better as the seasons go on. But folks, so, as but, season one, only episode seven, you know, he might have a very different idea about what about who Patrick about who Jean Picard is. I I come from a whole different perspective. I think that he is as as valiant and as stoic and as brave as any as any Starfleet captain. But this orb just came into his came face to face with him and shook the entire Enterprise like it was a rag dog. I think he was just scared. Mm, I think I don't, I don't. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. He was scared. Yeah, he was scared. But um, would Patrick Stewart? from season four, if he can go back in time and play him again in season one, that same episode, would he have done the same, you know, timidness? I, like, I, the ability for him to stand there and stare facing the God in the face, you know, quote unquote God in the face and knowingly he's like crapping his pants, but he stood there face to face. I, I think it was, I think it was a perfect demonstration of how Captain Picard at any level would face a threat that large because even when Q came, Q came. Yeah, I was just gonna say about Q. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say Q. Obviously, Q from that perspective was more powerful than that. Whatever that being was, whatever that ship was. Now, <laughs> Q did not demonstrate it at that level where obviously right. you know he shook the ship and and caused Captain Picard to become nervous. But <laughs> you know, from a character standpoint, I'm not sure if Patrick Stewart knew fully who captain Picard was at that point yeah like that, that's just a i mean i'm pretty sure patrick stewart would tell you that i would love to hear from patrick stewart from on that um especially while we still have him he's like i one thing that that is hard about watching this is how young captain picard is like how how young patrick yeah. stewart is um but i would love to know whether or not he would do that scene the same way my vote would be yes and i would love to know what the audience thinks this is a good place we we, we don't see it particularly eye to eye i think he would do it again because i think it shows um how our natural human tendency to respond to something that is uh, clearly a threat and clearly more powerful than you but still stand there like what's what's this what's that a quote um being able to trim you're, you're trembling but you still are able to speak truth it, it, it's a quote and i'll find it and probably uh put it in the notes for this episode but i i love that part and i, I thought i um i didn't notice it myself until like the last time i heard it. i watched it so anyway. but that being said all that being said like picard is just just all around a different character in season one 
the years and later seasons. Like, just look at how he so? treats. Oh, yeah. yeah look oh, how Wesley. He, Wesley. Well, yeah, yeah. Look how he treats yeah. Wesley. Look yeah. how he talked to Beverly in this episode. In this episode yes. alone. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I wrote that down too. I was like, he was a jackass yeah. to West to, to Beverly. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I was like, come I on. Don't, I don't know that. I mean, maybe, maybe Patrick Stewart understood at the very beginning who. Jean-Luc Picard was and is, and he wanted him to develop into a per- different person over the seasons. Ah, good. Or more, what's more than likely is that, uh, you know, he just didn't understand who, and neither did the writers understand who Jean-Luc, Bic- Jean-Luc exactly. Picard is. And, and, that's, and that's where I go back to, because the writers, I think, um, while obviously very talented from, you know, a, a topical depth of, you know, subject thing that they were putting out there. Um, I'm not sure that, that they had enough time to really understand who Captain Picard was either until they have had written him into additional scenarios and situations that required um, his character to be more developed. You're, I think you're, they were just kind of guessing. You both could be absolutely right. Very few people write a character at the beginning of a seven year journey and know exactly where they're starting and exactly where they want to take them. So you you guys are probably right. Right. Um, but on the flip side, I, I think it is it is plausible that um, they left room for his growth, because in season one, would we have wanted that warm and cuddly Captain Picard that he grew into uh, versus what you would expect from a commander of a ship who doesn't even know his own team. Like he doesn't, he knows Beverly, but he knows Beverly from, you know, being the captain of the stargazer and sending his, uh, her husband to his death. But she, he didn't have that relationship. She's still just an officer there because they're really on their seventh, uh, their seventh journey together. But that's something we can ask the actors. And, um, if I get enough, is it uh, the case? I, I kind of, I kind of thought that oh um, no they they were more than just uh just officers like they he was friends like good friends with uh Beverly with Beverly husband. yeah well yeah yeah no and, I'm saying and, I think and like I think the theory. relationship was I think the relationship was more based on Jack her husband more so yeah. than his personal relationship with her I don't I don't know if that's the case because like it's I don't know if it's apocryphal and actually it's okay. apocryphal. Yeah. But, you, um, yeah, somebody. I'm sure there's a Trekkie out there who is will clear that up for us. So we'll leave that it's, to it's the Trek, professionals. It's Trekka. It's Trekka, not Trekker. Tre- tre- yeah, Trek. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's 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 get no, to. No, let me let me go, let me let me, let me just finish what I was about to say. Oh um, yeah, go but, ahead. Um, I'm sorry. It's, it's apocryphal that um that or there's a theory, a fan theory that Picard is Wes's father. So. Oh well, yeah, of course what? everybody knows yeah. that. Yeah, I've never. Heard I mean, that everybody ever. knows that that is, but yeah, I've, I've heard that too. I have never heard that before. I absolutely love that theory. Okay, we have to do we have to do an episode just on that. All right, so let's get to some of the meat of it. So there's two different there's two real themes here that are the real story. Laws that are absolute and actually inside of that laws that are absolute underneath it, you also have um, laws from your system. How do you abide by your own laws? Right. They were really good to frame this. The writers were really good to frame this where it's not really a question of if the enterprise is going to be judged by the Edo's law. But will will this quote unquote God judge them by their own laws? And then they got put into the situation where they were going to have to break their own laws. So on the one side, you have the real question of law and justice. And then on the back end, the kind of um, fun thing that I like to think about is, like you said, Scott, that this is this is clearly from the Edo's perspective, it's God. But from our perspective, at best, it's a God, it's a, 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 a scientifically advanced. I think uh, data said it. Um, any civilization that is sufficiently advanced will appear as gods. Um, what are you? What What were your thoughts, Scott, about the the tension and the setup and the gambit, which was you're going to be judged by your own laws enterprise. And here is a creature, whether it, you think it's God or where you, whatever, it doesn't matter, but it's clearly powerful enough to do with you what you could do with the Edo. And they're going to judge you based on your own laws. And here they are having to break their own laws to save Wesley Crusher. what do you think about that setup and that dilemma? No, I mean, it was, it was genius, right? Because honestly, anybody could write a scenario or come up with a scenario where the enterprise just overpowers and, does what they want but being um being the creatures that they are and i say creatures because we're, we're you know they're coming from humanity mm-hmm. um but more advanced 
perspective of humanity where we actually truly do believe in our own laws to the to the extent that the prime directive really is supposed to take precedence over everything right Mm -hmm. so because we are at that level of advancement you know having to stick to and then then also be judged by whether or not we follow the prime directive was it was beautiful I, i think it was 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 exactly the setup that they needed because you know at the end of the day yeah, the enterprise could probably do what they want had they had not had any overarching power to, you know, put them in the right place if they if they chose to do something inappropriate. That is a great nod to um, uh, I don't know if you meant to do it, but Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan, where you have to have um, where is man versus man, uh, gladiator versus gladiator, but without an overarching. This is literally the word to use the yeah. overarching authority to which everyone. So all of a sudden, the captain, the team and the crew of the Enterprise, they were brought to the same level as the Edo. Right. Yep. And so what do you do in yep. that kind of position? Robin, you're about to jump in there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I weren't they violating the prime directive just by being there. Exactly. <laughs> Thank well, you. I was going to say the same thing, like because they they were not supposed to necessarily again first season, yes. and maybe and, 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 although Prime Directive technically was in the original, uh, the original but, series, yeah, yeah, um, the original series, but still, because they first season, they, so they maybe weren't they, a warp, they, they weren't a warped in, um, civilization, so they weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Enterprise, right? It's also, kind of an enterprise as well with a uh, with a uh, Scott Bakula. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, so but we I'm talking about from a writing place. perspective, right? Okay. Yeah, right. I'm talking about from a writing perspective. Like That's back in 1987, yeah, they had actually, you know, they had explored and already understood the prime directive. But yeah, from that perspective, they should not have been there because that. Uh, well, we're assuming exactly. they were not a warp driven society. Yeah. I don't know, warp capable society. So I, maybe if they were, if they were. Um, then being there was fine. If they were not, obviously that that violates the prime directive. So do we have to assume and 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 because to me, Robin, I'm with you. That's one of the things I wrote down that this is clearly a violation itself because they're not a sufficiently advanced enough civilization in my in in the way that they carry themselves. But that, I guess that that kind of suggests we're precluding the possibility of a warp civilization, a warp capable civilization of still having that kind of deference. And quote unquote innocence, um, deference to a quote unquote God, and I, I still do the air quotes for innocence. Um, and so we're making that judgment. But I think the assumption that we're all that I definitely you and me, Robin, are going under is if they were a warp sufficient, uh, a warp capable civilization, then they would have solved all these problems already, and they wouldn't have had this conflict in the first. Well, place. I wasn't. I was. I wasn't actually just thinking. Of, I wasn't thinking of that in per se. I was just uh, as you were talking. I was th- thought to myself, well. They might actually be a, a warp, uh, warp capable civilization. Like they mm-hmm. that that god is god over that star cluster. So perhaps they have a whole entire civilization going on that we're unaware of, oh. and they're just uh, differential to their god because their god has allowed them to be as successful as they are. Okay, so let's take it. Let's 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 assume that that the writers are consistent and there is a warp capable civilization there that we are unaware of. And so now you have this gambit where um, the prime directive is obviously they're conflicted within themselves, whether or not the crew of the enterprise is going to violate their own prime directive and the prime directive comes up against these absolute laws. And, and part of me thinks it's like a kind of a political philosophy kind of uh, uh, um conversation that the writers were trying to have about the possibility of a civilization that has absolute laws and if you have absolute laws then you can have absolute peace well any any thoughts on that on the edo's laws let's take let's take the um the federation's laws out of it let's just look at the edo's law is there obviously to us it seems ridiculous but to the writers, they seem they made it seem like it's plausible that if you ha- you can have a civilization of peace if you have a civilization of absolute laws. And and the and the, uh, one the main character or from Edo said, "Why would anyone risk death?" And that's why we have peace. What were your thoughts on that? I mean, one of you? Okay, and so now as you, now that you all have mentioned that they were all blonde hair and blue eyes, maybe the writers were actually trying to dig deeper into saying that hey, these are all blonde hair, blue eyed very easily following the the law of fascists right so mm-hmm. perhaps perhaps uh yeah there's a, a civilization of fascists the, the uh, of the ultimate fascist utopia yeah 
that's exactly I wasn't thinking about that. But when you say it like that, and if you don't mind getting a little closer to your microphone, Rob, oh, um, when you when you put it like that. Yeah, like that's the Aryan. That's the that's the Aryan nation dream. Right. The Aryan nation dream, these at laws of absolutes. And but they were the only difference is they were welcoming to outsiders. Right. So that's yeah. the kind of the chimera there. That's the the wild card. Um, but I mean, welcome- uh, so long as they weren't staying there. Right. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah there's a lot there's a lot in this episode so so you're saying robin you're saying it's very possible they're saying that this works i don't think the writers were trying to make a statement of how this could work i think that they were trying to set up a um what is it i don't have the the english words or the literature literary words for it but they're trying to set up a care a plot device here with this particular character the Edo where they're all the same race they're all the same color they're all the same they're all physically fit right that they made a big deal about that all of them physically fit all of them are physically beautiful and they have this wonderfully perfect world but it comes with absolutes okay setting aside the Edo I still want to know Scott or Robin what you think about laws of absolutes because that was a the main part of the conversation of the episode is can laws can just can justice ever come from absolutes even if it can't what of the fruits that it could produce because it produced this civilization the Edo only I think it was beautiful <laughs> only a Sith deals in absolutes all right so we have two different opinions on this all right Scott why is it beautiful no, I mean, in concept, obviously, the, the, the whole notion is ridiculous, right? But ideally, if the ultimate or I'm sorry, if the only punishment is death, then everybody, you know, while everybody around there was running around very happy, um, I think most folks would not necessarily be happy. They'd be worried about, you know, stepping on the wrong thing and have, being right. killed. Right. I don't think there would be happiness at that level. However, love it is obvi- it would obviously be a very effective deterrent, mm-hmm. uh, more so than, you know, the plethora of uh, punishments and laws from, you know, a slap on the hand to our own death penalty that we have right now. And and, and I say it's beautiful because in the notion of there being a, a, um, a group of people, uh, a group of whatever, who really have that idea of just only punishment is death. Um, I think it's it's a beautiful sort of, like you said, being applied device because, you know, it it's ridiculous, yeah. but yet it seems to be very effective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Robin. Um, yeah. Like I was saying, uh, um, only a Sith deals in absolutes. So, I mean, I was just saying that to be funny, but. Um, but it's, no, it's. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. But um, that being said, like that's not to delve into that statement of that statement itself is an absolute statement. But um, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, so obviously, the prime directive is so they have so Picard brought up two different laws. He has he is bound by law to protect Wesley and everyone on that ship. All right, right. And it, at the at the cost of his own life, all right. He has, he has sworn that that is a law he has to that, that he has to upload, uh, uphold, uphold rather. Um, but also, he has the prime directive to not to interfere. And so the, those two things are clashing with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a question of which one trumps which. I suppose the prime directive is called the prime directive for a reason. I guess that <laughs> trumps it. Um, but then he um Picard says is there can be no law there can be no justice if laws were absolute which um which goes to showing of like how uh his his duty to protect Wesley is a law but it's not absolute as compared to his duty to not interfere which i know this came like 10 years later um uh, but there is a law that they have to upload uh, uphold that usurps the prime directive um, which is the Omega, yeah, the Omega. Directive. Oh yes, yes, yeah, the Omega directive. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, since no, they obviously have no laws that are absolute. So why say that one is above the other? And go ahead, say Wesley. Remind me again of the uh, Omega d- directive. It's stupid. It's really stupid. <laughs> like, like it was it, from it was, Voyager, right? Yeah, it was from Voyager. Um, yeah, it was the ultimate element. And so if you find the ultimate element, everything else goes out the window. You have to find. You have to. Do I, 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 forgot what I also think that there's a reference to it in the in the novel in this in the uh, trilogy novel um, Star Trek Destiny, um, but it was all it's one of the it's 
Oh, you so it's Omega Directive. I'm thinking the Omega Particle. That's in uh, Star Trek Destiny, and that's something that was so powerful that the Borg. Um, no, that, that's 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 the Omega Directive. Is if you find the Omega Particle, you got to pursue it. Nothing else matters. It, nothing else matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, but you're 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 saying that in reference, like they only have. They, it seems as though they only have one absolute law. So you're saying the entire time this was a false choice. This was a false dilemma, rather. Right, exactly, because obviously, you know, they say that the prime directive is the ultimate law, but then no, they actually have other laws that are more ultimate than that. So they have a, they have, um, they're given leeway and judgment in, you know, mm-hmm. applying their laws. So Picard so, per- thought it was necessary. I'm sorry, I don't thought, mean to cut you off, but Picard was acting like uh, the guy said, well, if you break your own law, then you should suffer death. And Picard was so dramatic. He was like, I may suffer as much. But no, you're not because it's not an absolute law. Is that what you're saying, Robin? Uh, something like that. Um, or he, he can apply it. How he, he, he chose to save Wesley because he knows that their laws are not absolute despite um, them saying so. Right. So all of that aside, and, and, and not to say all of that aside, I just I have a question. Mm-hmm. Do you really think that you know, we're assuming that these this culture was humanoid or based on humans. Do you think that that level of um, punishment would bring um, clarity to uh, a group of people like that? And, and what I mean by clarity, it seems as if they really have nothing to discuss in or debate in or argue about. You break the law, you die. Mm-hmm. That's it. Is that level um, no, no, it didn't. Uh, punishment going to bring clarity and, and peace, peace to people? Like it that? doesn't. It doesn't because uh, Wesley's little girlfriend, she was uh, being traumatized mm-hmm, with the whole thing. Mm-hmm. All right. And That's so, no, it doesn't mm-hmm. bring peace. And she's going to be, she's probably, uh, they probably have some drugs to make her, you know, forget about Wesley. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that by itself, the laws, the, the one punishment, no, absolutely not. You can see it in her face and her, in her reaction to the whole thing. And well, what about that, just from a legal legal perspective? I mean, like, no, because I mean, if the you, people, the law, the law, the law is there to serve the, the to serve the people. The people aren't there to serve the law. So if she's upset, if other people are upset, then they're gonna there's there's gonna be an uprising eventually. If if the, if it keeps going as such, with any empire, I don't care if it's a galactic empire or just the empire there on Edo, right? They're not going to tell you about the resistance. I guarantee you, right. there's some people whose little brother. That's a big planet, and they only focus on a town the one, size of one facility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they focus on one facility. So there are there are there. I guarantee you, on that planet, it's just I, I you, you're you're going to have the rulers, and you're going to have the unruly. There's, I think that is a universal truth. So um, this is again, it was it was kind of an absurd plot device, but it it said they did it exactly that way so that we could have these kind of thoughts and these kind of conversations but to that end to your question scott no no it wouldn't because i'd be the first one to resist it all of us on this call (laughs) people listening to this we'd be the first ones hell i mean captain picard he resisted it right there in that moment and and so did so did wharf and and tasha yar so uh and so did those children to a certain extent so did the children exactly right all right um there's a couple other things in there that um um that I wanted to add, but actually Scott, I think you nailed it, right? That, that was going to be my next question was going to be a, a, about how that could be a governing and, and could it actually stand and how does that resonate um, in a civilization? What did y'all, did you, did you think there was anything, do you feel like the question of whether or not that entity was um, not, not to us, the viewer guide, but the question of it being, sufficiently sufficiently advanced enough to appear as God to the Edo and quite frankly to to the Federation to the crew of the Enterprise because by the end of the show Picard has started referring like speaking like he's just speaking out into at the end his speech that he gave he just speaks up into the air he says I don't even know if this is how I communicate how do I do I need to get on my knees do I need to pray what, what do I do he starts he starts giving it deference as though it was a sufficiently advanced enough civilization to where it needs to be respected to a certain way. Do you feel like that entire conversation was a distraction and the core conversation was about law and justice? Or do you think that they were running two parallel conversations for us to like debate? Like, is there a concept of God in, is there the possibility of a concept of God in the universe that is merely just so far advanced like you? 
I obviously there were two di- to me there were two different sort of you know storylines going on there the the concept of God and then also the concept of absolute laws and <gasps> my question kind of along those lines is it, it's kind of curious do you think that the Edo developed their laws based upon their notion or their concept of their God? That I, or you referenced that earlier in this ep- in, in in our conversation. Um, I don't know. I don't because the question then would be: Has their God treated them with that same level of absolute? Right. And, like, and, was it was there some sort of Bible? Was there some sort of guidance, or was this just an ethos that they came up with on their own, um, mm-hmm. based upon you know kind of how they evolved over the the their years so or what have did you. they come up with their laws themselves or were these laws given to them by the Edo God? Right. 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 Because, because then, well, I think we can, we can kind of discern that from how the episode went because there goes the next part. Um, when, when after captain Picard and we talked about this off air, he told data that he was babbling and um and then when I heard the word Babel in this context, I'm like, it does take me back to the Tower of Babel and the the disconnect between language and how data became the conduit to understand the language of the Edo God, right? Um and so but then the next it was the very next conversation that he had with Captain Picard where he sat down and they started having this conversation. And the question came up Will the Edo God be rational? reasonable will he govern a court or will they govern according according to logic and and so i think we can infer whether or not the laws came from the Edo god or just the Edo people doing that to themselves because at the end what prevailed a logical argument prevailed and it was actually the argument from commander Riker. commander Riker said uh hang on because i'm getting old he said um when has justice ever been as simple as a rule book and the way we know his argument prevails because Captain Picard confirmed, he said, seems like someone up there agrees with you, number one. <laughs> and they teleported out. So I think from that, we can see that the Edo God was actually rational because otherwise they would have destroyed him. If they were if they were a God of absolutes, then they would have held the enterprise to their own absolute law, to the to the absolute nature of the prime directive. That would be my. So what they did. What they did not explore, though, after that is what impact did that leave on the Edo, right? Because yeah. their God left, let the their the the guy, I mean, let them leave. There was no punishment for them. So does I this now like change the Edo and how they think? I feel like there was an episode yeah. later on, or maybe it was a, a book that showed that they went into war. After that, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm really? maybe I'm mistaken. I might be mistaken. Hold on. See, there are too many. Per- Listen, and to everyone who's like an actual Trekkie, like I'm a Trekkie, yeah. and I I know a lot. But there are people who know the canon, like some yeah, of us yeah, know yeah. the Bible. So yeah, yeah. to we're, all of you, we're not we're not we're, real Trekkies. That's <laughs> Trekkies, not, right? <laughs> we yeah, we we have seen. We, uh, I've seen everything but DS9. I haven't seen but two seasons of DS9. And um, I'm going to I'm going to watch it, Robin. I saw the reaction on your face. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I haven't seen all of mine, the Robin. I've seen all of Voyager. I've seen all of uh, Enterprise. I've seen all of obviously TNG. But I think I maybe have watched two seasons, maybe three seasons. Of yeah. OK, so we need we need to like just cut TNG right now and just start from the beginning of DS9 <laughs> because that is the best <laughs> series, period. Everybody's telling me that. Well, Scott asked the question, what, what did that do to the Edo? Because their God let the, let the invaders get away with breaking their laws. That, well, that, that in their a, mind, their laws were absolute. Depends on if they're a, uh, a single planet civilization or a spacefaring civilization that's uh, going planet that? to planet. Oh, because if they're stuck to their planet, then they're going to continue uh, worshiping their gods. Just maybe you'll have a couple of uh, people who, you know, who say that you know what it is. Just, that was the beginning of atheism on that planet. <laughs> that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the rejection of the influence of God in their society. It had to. It would happen a lot faster if um if they were a spacefaring civilization. Fair. That would have been a great book to for someone to have written the the exploration of of what happens when 
you know, uh, 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 for all intents and purposes, whether or not they thought their God was real at that moment in time that their God was revealed and he let their God did not necessarily agree with the laws that they had put in place. What happens to a society then? And, and, and do they remain so peaceful and Eden like? But that also, goes back to your question. Also, Scott. like what uh, what's what's the all we know is that they have laws to not break. Like who made the laws? All right. Mm-hmm. Did, did the guy make the law? Like, I mean, would he well, care? That, exactly what Scott was asking earlier. Scott said, where do I, you were out? You, you stepped away for a second, Robin. And he said, uh-huh. where did their laws come from in the beginning? Is it something that came from them, from their culture? Or was it something handed down to them from their God? Right. right. And if so, we could do a one a, 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 a analysis of this. If it came from their God. Then did their he, God is a hypocrite. Was- and he'll just, he'll just, well, and if they have any type of uh, resistance, he'll just smite them. Right, yeah. right. Well, well, yeah, exactly. He'll just smite them. That's so I their... think honestly, it can't. It one, I think the laws could not have come from their uh-huh. God, because their God would have then demonstrated that he they are a hypocrite. I'm saying they plural because it was a civilization in a ship, right? Then they would have been a hypocrite to allow the enterprise to leave treating them right. spe- with a special treatment that they're not even giving their own children. Right. So right. my argument would be the, this is, this has to be something that Edo did to themselves and therein lies the real conversation, <laughs> whether or not we're ready to have it on air. How much of this are we just doing to ourselves? <laughs> you know, Everything? even, All you know, <laughs> we do it to, that's the, that's the message that the writers were trying to send. The real message underneath this is, Whatever your concept, this is my take. And then we can close it out here because we this will be hour two. We watched it and then now we're at 45 minutes uh, or hour and a half. 45 minutes watching. 45 yeah, and I got a break too. So. Yeah. So so I'll give you my moral of the story. Scott, you give us your moral of the story. Robin, you give us your moral of the story and we'll get out of here. Uh, my moral of the story is the writers on this episode wanted to communicate it to us very clearly that the punishments that we are giving ourselves on this planet here, Earth, is our own doing. And we get to choose our system of justice. And the core message is that justice has never been as simple as a rule book. And that rule book can be your constitution. That rule book can be your Bible or your holy book. Um, And they're also saying no matter what is out there that is not even explainable by the 24th century Federation, um, it must be based on, well, the argument in this episode is, is that it's very likely that it could be based on science, could be based on science and technology. And if it's based on science and technology, that it is a logical entity Therein, the question, right, uh, the the argument that was made at the end that helped them get free. I think that's what the writers were trying to tell us. And for this to be one of the most unpopular episodes, I think it was absolutely brilliant. That's all I got. Scott. I don't have a whole lot more to add to that, Ben. I, I kind of agree. I I hope that, you know, the writers were thinking along those lines. I I oftentimes I wonder what writers think when they write, because, you know, me, I've written stuff and I don't some stuff just comes out and then you go back and you reread it and you're like, Oh yeah, it could actually mean that, but you never know what the intent was originally. You just wrote, you know, just as make sure you're writing something. But yes, I agree. I I, I think if, if that was the case, they, they were brilliant. They wrote something really, really challenging because at the end of the day, you know, how do we justify, you know, the, the instantiation of whatever punishments for whatever laws, especially if we consider them absolute, like if they end up being absolute, then, you know, we're all kind of screwed at that point, regardless of what it is. So um, I think they're, if their intent truly was to make us think and, and have that, that insight, I think it was brilliant. Mm. Robin. I guess the moral of the story is that according to Star Trek, a fascist Aryan nation would be a utopia. <laughs> As compared to a fascist <laughs> black nation, would be civilized and, and barbaric. So, yeah. There we go. I'm not in a joking mood today. Yeah, maybe we have, maybe I can break up. That was good, Rob. I, <laughs> that was good. No, no, that's a, that's the perfect balance for the show. I want to leave the audience with my favorite scene. And and next week when we do this, um, you guys can decide between yourselves which episode is your favorite and you want us because I appreciate you guys y'all let me pick this one um, so whatever episode of Star Trek or anything because I don't think we have to limit it to Star Trek but we'll figure that out um, 
bring it to us and we'll watch it next Saturday and, or, or whatever day and we'll do the same thing. I want to leave the audience with my favorite scene when Captain Picard was again scared out of his, actually out of his communicator. This, <laughs> this thing out there was so powerful that he had to take out off his communicator and tell him to get her out of their ship before their God destroyed them. And at the end, Counselor Troy said something I think is brilliant. Um, we'll leave you with that and then we'll see you. Ah, what happened? Not with hurry. It's still coming towards us. Transport chief to captain. One to beam down to away team location. Hurry. Engage. Transporter room. Urgent. Engage. It seems the Edo's God is very protective of its children. I had no choice but to learn about that thing from her. I'm sorry I had to. She was so frightened. So were you. It's understandable, sir. (laughs) Sharing an orbit with God is no small experience. Sharing an orbit with God is no small experience. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Scott, Robin... See y'all next time. Yep, yep. All right. Take care of you. Follow me, follow me at Twitter at DSSD or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're supposed to do that. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Scott. No, no. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, let's, yeah, no, let's do it proper. Hey, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll, we'll do it next time. What do you, wait, wait. What do you promote? This might be a really popular episode. You never know. What are you promoting? Scott? Yeah, that's true. At Scott Dixon Books. Ex- all Scott the all Dixon. of the uh, social media. What, what, at Scott what, what, Dixon what, what, Books. What book? What book? Yeah, what is the name of the book? Oh, yeah, I did write a book. Send me a link. <laughs> Send me a link. Hang on. Yeah. I, do I have it? www.scottdixonbooks.com at Scott Dixon Books. Hang and on uh, screen, it's, a, Scott it's, a, it's a middle grade book, but it's good Dixon. for everybody. Trust me. And what's the name of your book, Scott? Kid Vega and the Sorcerer of Molly. The narrative is compelling. The plot is compelling. And even though it is for middle schoolers, it is um, it's definitely up my alley. So <laughs> I enjoyed it. Robin, yeah, it's, plug it's, yourself. it's deep on many levels. It's deep on many levels. It's, it's yeah, entertaining it's for middle book. schoolers and deep on them. Go ahead, Robin. Um, I'm, just, I'm just Robin. You can find me at the, the SSD, D-E-E-S-T-R-S-D, Twitter. Oh. Um, nothing, nothing to promote. Nothing All to right. promote. Just, I'm just here. You All got right. something to promote, but we'll get to that next time. Yeah, we'll get we'll get there one day. We'll get there one day. Well, I, I don't know about it. Y'all haven't told me about it, but I guess I'm out. I mean, y'all in the same city, so I guess that counts for something. So, okay. you All you right. do. I know exactly what you're promoting. It's, yeah, yeah. Thank you for jogging my memory, Scott. But we have edited it out because it is remains to be seen and it's coming soon. And the rest of y'all probably know me because we don't we don't the only audience we have is my political audience and then maybe one day we'll grow this science fiction whatever whatever this is that we're doing. Uh but it's basically three brothers hanging out watching some of our favorite shows and talking about it afterwards. So see you next yep, time. Yep. Jesus.